let's go ahead because you can bring all this stuff in. Let's talk about some simple things you can do that really work within uh, just Ecotect to start getting you for to some of the different things that we need to do for the purpose of the assignment. Okay, And there's some specific things we want to do that are really all about kind of getting this model ready for analysis. You'll see even here I'm in the 3D editor view as opposed to the visualize view. The visualize view kind of like uh, grays things out to the surfaces, kind of makes it more of a hidden line view. 3E editor is showing us a uh, just the uh, wireframe view, and right now I have it turned on so the coloration is just based on the different zones. So you can see those blue surfaces are the glazing surfaces, the pink surfaces are the exterior walls, that lofted wall is the green surface, the grounds this kind of gold surface. So here's what you can do. As we go ahead and think about cleaning things up and getting ready for analysis, a couple things we need to do. We've imported our model. We're looking pretty good over there. There are some things we're going to do about setting the location, the orientation, and putting in the right climate data. Okay, we'll talk about that. And there's also some things we're going to do to sort of clean the model up itself, the actual model data. And for that, we're going to look at sort of are there any sort of stray surfaces that need to be closed? You know, are there any surfaces we want to hide or unhide based on sort of what's going to be important? We're going to think about all those different surfaces and think about like really what the U value, the thermal properties, as well as the reflectance are, because those are two things. The U value will affect our thermal analysis. The reflectance will affect our daylighting. Okay. And we're also going to think about the zones themselves and the zones in terms of really how they're being used and what the thermal properties of those zones are. So let's kind of like approach it from uh, both sides. Okay. And actually, how about this? What I'm going to do just to make our life a little bit easier for this next phase is rather than working with the Ito house, because the Ito house has a lot of complex surfaces, let me go ahead. I'm going to switch back to sort of a simpler house. Okay, one that I did actually for Brenton last time with uh, the Solar Decathlon folks, which is, has just fewer surfaces. It'll be a little bit quicker in terms of computations. It'll just be a little bit easier to work with for the purpose of what we're doing here. But the same principle will apply. So, well, actually, let me, let me do this location and orientation. I'll do it on the main model, and, and then I'll go ahead and switch to the other one when it's time to actually start the analysis. Well, look, we'll get you this, hopefully the best of both by doing both for you. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. Let me do the uh, idea of the accurate context, the location, the orientation, and the climate data, and then we'll clean up the model. So here's what that stuff looks like. Let me switch back over to Ecotect, and here we are. By default, our model really doesn't have any particular place that it is. And we would should go ahead and put it a place because the location will determine the latitude and longitude, which will be very important for how the sunlighting is hitting the house, um, as well as the weather data, because we need detailed weather data about what the temperature profile is throughout the entire year, the ups and downs, how cold it is at night, how warm it is during the day, so we can actually have an accurate analysis of uh, what it's going to take to heat and cool this place. Okay, so where all the location data and the project data around that lives is in, it's either up here in the toolbar, you can say set the current time and location, there's a little widget right there. There's also, I think it's under model, I can say site and location, two different ways to get to the same exact dialogue. So take your pick, either one's going to work. In terms of the location, Okay, there's a latitude and longitude and a time zone, and it's really all based on some location that we're setting. Okay, and we can use Google Maps now to do that. That's interesting. It used to be you couldn't do that, or you can go ahead and find it based on a specific file. Let me go ahead and find it based on a file, because we have some weather data files, and even tell you how you can get your own file. So, oh, let me come up here, and I'll say load a weather file, and take a look. Now, in the default weather files, you'll find that within Australia, there actually are a fair number of water, uh, weather files available for you to work with. Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, Sydney, a couple different ones there. So we can choose Melbourne, okay, say OK. And when we do, it says, should we update the latitude and longitude, the global position, to match the climate file? And we generally would say yes. Okay. Seems to know what the local time zone is, what the latitude and longitude are. That should be fine. So now, as we're thinking about the sun and the shadows and the direction of the sun and the sky, hopefully it will be uh, a lot better in terms of what's applicable for you there. 
Now, depending upon where your house is, okay, for example, if you need to get to Tokyo or you need to get to some other place on Earth, we may need to switch that to a different location. So, for example, I could go again and say load a weather file. And I'm not sure if there's even a Tokyo, Japan in here. I don't think there is. Is there an Asia? I don't see that. So I'll show you how you basically can go out and get to some of that stuff. Okay, so you can load the existing files that are already in here and that would be fine. Okay, like Melbourne. Okay, another thing you can do is once you have it there, just really adjust the position of the project orientation relative to the way the data is located in the little editor. For example, right now in the editor, it's a little hard to see. Let me kind of rotate that up a little further. Okay. It's assuming north is that side of the house. If that's not where north is, and we need to switch that, I can again go back to project and just orbit that around a little bit. Okay, and that'll change the sun. So you're just cho choosing the relative orientation compared to the, uh, the project north. So the actual north to project north. Okay, you can sort of flip it there. Another thing you can do in this dialog, which is a good thing, is this whole notion of really what the local terrain is. It turns out that even within the weather files, there's a lot of difference between being an exposed environment. You're out on a cliff, you're out on the seaside, you're exposed to the elements very uh, heavily, and things change rapidly. Rural being somewhere in between, suburban getting more and more dense, and finally urban. Urban environments tend to have uh, more heat stored in the ground, uh, more protection from wind. Just, you know, the way you actually choose the terrain has a small effect, not a huge effect, but a small effect on what the results are. So you want to get that as accurate as possible. So let's say maybe that house is somewhat suburban. Okay, so now the sun, the shadows will be appropriate for Melbourne anyway. But that may or may not be what we're interested in. Let's say instead we had to go to someplace different. Okay, and what you can do is actually load in weather files for different environments. So let me show you what I mean. Okay, if you don't have a weather file for what you need, let's talk about how you can get it. Because if that list didn't have what you need, we need to go out and get it somewhere. It turns out there's a huge repository of all these weather files that are out living on the web, and we can go out and grab those. Okay, and that's kind of good because uh, someone's done all the hard work collecting that stuff. We just have to go out and find them and let me show you where you do. What I'm going to do is say that, okay, we're going to get some uh, climate data and we're going to get them from what I call the Energy Plus website. Okay, because they actually point us to a whole lot of them. We're going to import them as an EPW file. That's a weather file format for Energy Plus and save them as a WEA, which is a file format that uh, Ecotech likes for weather. So let me show you what I mean. Now I am very bad about remembering URLs. I'm not sure how you are, but what I'm going to do is switch over and kind of go to a specific dialog. Actually, let me pull this over so you can actually see what I'm up to. In my Dropbox, in that folder that I left out there for you guys to download, you'll actually find there is, under Weather Files, even a URL to go to right there. Let's see, oh, come on, you. Will that not open? Well, somehow it works if you're in Safari, but it's not working here. Let me go into, let me pull uh, this across. And we'll say, oh, what do I want to be? I want to be energy plus. Beautiful. Let me just grab this URL while we're out here and put it in the little presentation for you. Well, got two of them. Okay, let's save that away.
So that'll be available for you. But let's take a look at how it actually works. If you go out to that website, four different locations like in Asia, we can say we want to go to Japan, and then we can say, oh, how about for Tokyo? And download a series of weather files. Okay, it's actually a pretty small little series of files. When we download that series of files, what it does is it, uh, as a zip file, it'll bring in a whole bunch of uh, little guys. Let's say, let's open the downloads folder. Looks like it didn't expand it. Okay, you'll find there's a bunch of different files in there. There's an EPW file, a DDY file. I tend to use the EPW file. All right, there, that guy. So how we actually use that is as follows. Once you've downloaded that and you have it on your machine, what you can do is in Ecotect, we actually go to some tool called to be the weather tool, but I'm just thinking right now. There it is. Okay, here's the way the weather tool works. The weather tool actually shows us all sorts of weather data, you know, for all the different areas that it understands. Okay, and if we want to add a new one, what we do is we say that we want to open and we go out and find the file that we've just downloaded. Let me go see if I can find that. It's under Downloads. Okay, I'm going to change it to the EPW file since that's the one I want to grab. Okay, it basically just unpacks the file for us. We can say Import it. Okay, and here is weather data now for Tokyo instead. Once we have this saved away, or now that we have imported it, we can save it as a WEA file, and no worries. Okay, we'll get you going. Thank you for the time check. We'll save this away, and I'll say that it's the uh, Tokyo weather file. And let me all again, I'll just put that on the desktop. Okay, now that we have that saved away, what we can do is back over here in Ecotect, I close the weather tool, we can now load in that file instead. I'll load my weather file. I'll go out to the desktop where I can not so conveniently left it. And there's the Tokyo weather file. Okay, so now it's got the right latitude and longitude. It'll have the appropriate shadows. Everything will be appropriate for Tokyo. So watch out for that. You need a good weather file. And if you can't find one in the library, again, we're going to go out to that Engineering uh, Energy Plus weather file server and like do that little bit of conversion. So sorry if that went by a little fast, but you'll, you'll kind of catch it on the video the second time around as well as I left the URLs there for you. Okay, so if we have our weather file in and that's looking good, and we have our location set and our orientation set. We're pretty much ready to start like analyzing this model file. So let's take a look at that. Let me go back to the 3D editor and I'll orbit this around a little bit. Okay, in terms of the types of analysis we want to do, let's go back and take a look at your list. And I'll, I'll kind of show you this issue of kind of cleaning things up a little bit uh, just in the context of what we're doing. The materials characteristics in the U-value, as well as the zones, well, let's get all that stuff as we're here in terms of what's going on. Although, now I will switch to that simpler model just because it'll be a little bit uh, fewer, fewer points to work with. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to open up a slightly different model. This is the model, uh, a model that uh, I use that just has like a few simple rooms and a lot less triangulation. I'm going to open one. Oh, again, it's going to be out in the Dropbox. And model files Revit. Oh, 
That's funny. I never save things the way I do. I let me see. Let me uh, import. And again, I'll go to Dropbox. I'll import uh, this one. It's called Solar Decathlon Sample. Open that up. This is one, again, has some very basic spaces. It's a little like a two-room house kind of set up for the solar decathlon uh, characteristics, but it'll be a good example for what you need. Let me load in for this one. I'm going to load in sort of a materials mapping that I already put together, and I'll say open this as a new file. Okay, and as you'll see, this is just kind of a simpler model. That's the only reason I'm going here. I just want to kind of make my life a little simpler. Hey, let me orbit that around a little bit. Even in here, as I go through and visualize, I notice there's a small little problem. Because I fixed it, but I'm not loading up the right one. Let me move this over there just so I can kind of fix something. I think last time I demoed, I put things in a funny place. Okay, there we go. So here we have a little model. Just let me give you a sense of what it looks like because it'll uh, be good for what we're doing here. It's just, uh, we're going to visualize it here. orbit around. It's basically like a little house with a butterfly roof, a little living area, kitchen area, a couple of bedrooms, a little bathroom on the backside. It's really just meant to be a very small little house, but it will go through and demonstrate some of the basic principles of like a, what we want to get at. Okay, and in terms of this, there's a couple of big things we need to think about in terms of you know, just sort of setting it up for uh, doing the analysis the way we want. Okay, there. if we think about Oh, back over here in the outline, there's this notion of the materials characteristics as well as the zone characteristics. So let's talk about each of those. If I go back over to Ecotect, you'll see that we have things like, oh, for example, that's a floor surface. That floor is currently designed as concrete slab on ground. That may be appropriate for the floor. That's kind of okay. If I come over here and grab that wall surface, you'll see I have something called brick timber frame. Now, brick timber frame may or may not be a good choice for you. That's kind of brick on top of like a stud, a wood frame stud system. You know, you may want something else in there. We have some nice choices in here, like here's some of the existing ones, rammed earth, reverse brick veneer, timber clap masonry, or my favorite, framed timber plaster, which is what we call like a wood frame wall with stucco on the outside. So we might go ahead and choose that one instead. So I can choose this one wall, then I can come over and choose that wall, then I can come over and choose this wall, and then I can come over and choose that wall. But really quickly you're going to figure out that that's not a very efficient way to do it. So instead what I'm going to do is basically say select all the matching objects. Oops, hang on. I think I even goofed that up a little bit as I was doing it. Select all the matching objects, okay, and that'll go through and grab all the ones that have that property. Let me add this one back in. I changed it, okay, because I really want to grab all these at the same time and change their characteristics just in one fell swoop. So here's how we can do that. I can go through and change the material, okay, and I can select a material like framed timber plaster, if that's what I have in mind. Say OK, and now those are all changed. They have that property instead. There's actually two materials, a primary material and an alternate material. The alternate material is what material is used if you actually have two surfaces that are back to back against each other. For most of what we're doing, that won't really make much of a difference, but it's available to us, just so you know about it. Okay, but what we're actually going to do is go through and try changing the properties to something a little bit different. For example, this whole framed timber wall is kind of okay in terms of framed timber plaster. It has a U value of 2.2 right now, which actually isn't very good. There's not a lot of insulation in this wall. And I'm going to apologize right now because actually the way I think about R values and U values is at a very different scale than it works within SI units. So I'm going to throw out some numbers that could be very, very inaccurate right now because I always think in terms of R values based on the, uh, the U.S. imperial scale as opposed to the SI scale. So what we want to do in principle, and I'll trust you guys to go through and adapt the, number, adapt the numbers to be what it needs to be you know, for your scaling system, is 
I'm going to go through and oh, change a name right over here. I'm going to say that framed timber plaster, I'll just call it wood frame with stucco and insulation. Okay, and we would call it like R13, R19. Oh, there's a U value that will make more sense to you. And again, I'll apologize because I have a different sense of scale. Okay, U value is listed right here. There's certain properties of the wall we can set. And if I go through and say, show me the thermal analysis properties, there's a little dialogue here or pull down that lets us focus on those. Okay, we can say these are the things that are most affecting the thermal analysis. So I can say, oh, if the U value now is 2.2, let's say by adding the insulation, I'm going to cut that to a third. And I think the way these values are, that probably would be about right. Let me say it's, oh, say 0 0.8 as a starting point. Okay. What I want to do is I have a new material. I've entered a new U value. And you can go ahead and enter any U values that make sense. So relative to your analysis of the houses, if you know what the U value of the walls is, create wall types that match the U values you want to use. And when you are ready for that, go ahead and say, I want to either add a new element or add it globally. I'll say add a new element. It'll put it just into this space or into this project. So now I have that available. It's available to choose. So there's really two classes of things we typically change about properties. We tend to change things like the U values or the solar absorption. Again, if you know the properties of the houses, you can go ahead and put those in. Or even as you suggest new properties because you're insulating the walls or changing the properties, you can. The other thing you may want to change has to do with it's more the lighting analysis. And that's this issue of the reflectivity, the reflectance of the walls. So you can go ahead and change that. So go ahead and Simon, ask, yeah, I'm watching you type, so let's get the question out. Okay, so let me go ahead and do this. We have been kind of playing around with these elements and kind of changing uh, the thermal properties. The other one that I want to sort of point out is this issue of reflectivity. The reflectivity over there is uh, what, if you take a look at the external or the external internal surfaces, you can change a color, and this is really this overall notion of just how brightly reflective things are. Now, if you're trying to improve your daylighting, some people will just slide that way up and try to like change it to over 80%, and that's really not very realistic. But be aware of the fact that when you're doing daylighting, it does make a difference about whether you're uh, looking at a dark surface or a light surface. The light surfaces reflect a lot more light back. Okay, let me go ahead and just set the color. That's fine there. And I'll say close to that. Now, uh, sure. Okay, we could also go through and, for example, change the windows. Right now, there's single glazed timber frame windows. Let me go ahead and select the matching objects. Maybe I would say that for the purpose of my analysis, or maybe for the analysis of my improvements, I'll say, what would happen if instead of being single glazed timber frame, they were instead double glazed? Okay, and that would have a different set of uh, U values that would probably be a lot better. Okay, but go ahead and remember to model your original house as it is today, and then save your improvements for actually the interventions that you're suggesting. Don't go ahead and kind of uh, make all the changes in advance. Okay, so try and model the first one accurately. So once you've gone ahead and set those up, here's what you're going to do. Oh, one other thing to do in terms of uh, getting ready to do the analysis, there's the issue of zones. Let's talk about that. Because zones is actually where you set the whole notion of uh, like how the heating and cooling is going to work. And let me show you where that fits. Okay, it is over here in the properties palette. The first thing had to do with uh, just selecting. The second one is zones. And I'm actually going to select all the zones right now, one through five. Those are all my interior rooms. And I'll say, let's look at the zone management. Here are the big things you need to sort of know about the zones. There's this notion of, as you work with a space and you think about the thermal characteristics, how many people are in the space? Because the more people are in the space, the more heat they'll produce. So whether it's an office or a restaurant or a shop or whatever it is, I'm going to go ahead and say it's relatively few people. Oh, maybe there's eight people in the house. They're not really generating a lot of heat. And you can decide whether they're walking, dancing, or sleeping, whatever it is they're doing there. 
Okay, but based on that, there's an internal heat gain that's going to be generated, and that's how that gets accounted for. You'll find that if you have a crowded office, okay, there's really quite a bit of uh, heat that's put into the building, and we have to sort of account for that in the air conditioning system. Internal gains are things like, oh, equipment, uh, like office equipment, or things that sort of put off excessive heat, and you can sort of incorporate that too. But the real critical one I want to tell you about is the second tab. For this project, do we assign one zone for house? Yeah, in general, I would go through, actually, Simon, I would choose, like, you know, all the zones and then sort of, like, apply the characteristic to the zones. Because what it is is the zone is really just, it's a, it's a collection of different surfaces. So what I would do is just, kind of like what I did here, just grab all the different zones in the list. Yours will look a little bit different as opposed to room one, room two, room three. Yours will say like the different layers in the model, but again, say zone management and pull this up. Okay, now in terms of really the important things about thinking about the hours of operation we can set for the house, you know, you can think about it in a weekday, maybe actually, you know, the daylight hours are the ones that are unoccupied. You can sort of choose what the range of values in terms of where you think it's going to be actively heated or cooled versus not, and whether it's different on the weekends. You know, I'm so used to modeling offices all the time. It's more like doing the eight to five and like less on the weekends. Houses actually have kind of the opposite characteristics. Maybe for the weekends, we have to kind of keep them actively heated and cooled all the time. And we just get to sort of play around with uh, the notion of like uh, not being heated and cooled during the day. I kind of think about actually do how to do that with a split range. Hmm. Can I even do that? I got to think about that. There's got to be some way to do that in terms of doing it on both sides. Other important things to consider here are the issue of the type of system natural ventilation, mixed mode, full air heating and cooling. Let's talk about that. No heating and air conditioning system whatsoever, okay, means that your box is going to never be heated or cooled. It's just going to sort of build up heat and then like never have a way to dissipate it. So it's sort of like a, or get cooled down. Natural ventilation says you don't have heating or cooling, but you do have the ability to open the windows when you want to either get the warm air in or the cool air in, depending on which way you want to sort of be pushing the house right now. So uh, natural ventilation is no active heating or cooling. It's just only the ability to open windows. Okay. Full air conditioning, you might imagine, is you have a full heating and a full cooling system. And what happens is in full air conditioning, you'll never open the windows. You'll always go through and use the air conditioning system, like we used to build a lot of buildings you know, that were closed to the outside elements. And mixed mode is halfway between. So in a mixed mode system, we have heating and air conditioning, but Whenever we can, we'll use the natural heating or cooling to open the windows and take advantage of that. So some different choices in there that are uh, kind of really important and will make a big difference on your energy analysis. I'll be smart and say that it's more of a mixed mode system, but I could say full air conditioning. And then you have the set points here in terms of the heating and the cooling in terms of where those should kick in especially as you're thinking about your interventions. Think about using the thermostat range. You'll find that actually changing the thermostat range makes a very big difference in terms of, uh, you know, changing it by just a degree or two could really make a very big difference in the energy use. But I'll leave that as the default for right now. We can play around with that as one of our changes.